Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the ninth year of Voices from the Vanguard, which, as many of you know, is a joint production by the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases and the Knight Chair in uh, Medical Writing at Grady College. Pat Thomas and myself, Dan Colley, have been doing this now for quite a while, and we're really pleased that you came. Today, um, Mary Galinsky is here to speak with us, and she's here at UGA also as the guest of UGA's One Health Initiative, uh, led by Professor Susan Sanchez down in the front. And tomorrow, Mary will be featured in an all-day symposium called The Secret Life of Malaria. That'll be from about 9.30 until 5, and it's down in the Coverdell Center, down in the other end of campus, uh, in room 175. It is free, but it helps if you register online. So if you'd like to come and hear more about malaria, even the secret life of malaria, tomorrow is the day to do it. Uh, I also want to remind you that there is a reception next door in Demonstinian Hall following tonight's lecture and you can meet with Dr. Glinsky and, and talk with her there uh, and gather for a few snacks. So introducing Mary Glinsky is a daunting task uh, because it's hard to decide where to start and equally hard to decide where to stop. Mary started out as on a fairly standard path for a biological scientist. She got an undergraduate degree in biology, followed by a master's uh, and then a PhD from NYU, and where she also did her postdoctoral training and then joined the faculty. So she hung out in New York State for quite a while. Then in 1998, somebody lured Mary and her husband, uh, Dr. John Barnwell, to head south to Atlanta. Uh, she to Emory University and he to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Both are malaria experts, so this was really quite a boon for malaria work in the Atlanta area, uh, for which I take full credit. <laughs> although there were many others involved. I take full credit tonight anyway. Uh, Mary's career breaks some cherished stereotypes of academics working away, isolated in their lab, focused only on their science. This is because Mary's vision encompasses much more than that. It encompasses the real world in many ways that most investigators really don't think about. And in fact, some of what Mary does is the worst nightmare for some investigators. <clears throat> but since the early days of her career, she's wanted to translate the basic science that she does into policies and practices that actually have something to do with the real world and using what she knows. So she had just become an assistant professor at NYU when she founded and became the president of the Malaria Foundation International. This is an advocacy group that promotes effective malaria control and raises both awareness and money uh, for this disease that rests mainly on poor people, especially poor children. So Mary is that rare person who exceeds in two arenas, both as a scientist and as an advocate. Most scientists don't do that if you don't know that already. <clears throat> I said it would be hard to stop talking about Mary, but I will. Uh, but I do have one final thought. Uh, I think it's a good idea not to get too adversarial during the question and answer period after her talk. Mary is a second degree black belt in Chokwain Do, and she's training to become a third degree black belt. Now this is martial art that supposedly, according to the website, says, non-contact, non-fighting, non-competitive martial art. But you may not want to test that. Mary, would you please join us. So 
Can you hear me okay? Is this, this is working, the mic right here? Okay, thank you very much, Dan. That was a very nice introduction, shows that you have followed my career uh, for well over 20 years now, and actually close to 30. And in fact, I, it was a big challenge to take on a presentation like this because it wasn't necessarily just about the science or just about the advocacy, but I understand there's a rather broad, diverse audience here, so I do hope I can speak in a way that you know just about everyone here would have some benefit from taking the time to be here today. So first of all, thank you for being here. Title is Game On, Systems Biology versus Malaria. The bulk of my talk will be focused on this new consortium project involving Emory University, Georgia Tech, UGA, and CDC. But to begin, where to begin, as Dan said. We, we do a lot of different things, and I've been involved for literally 30, 30 years, and my mom asked me at least once a week, are you making any progress, Mary? And, uh, and I asked myself, too, are we? And we are, in fact, I would say just about every week. There's progress in one way or another against this disease. It's just a big problem. And what will the next 30 years show? It's so unpredictable. And we can talk about more of that as we get into Q&A. But we, we can't predict where the next year will go, let alone the next 5, 10, 30. Why malaria is a huge problem. It's in 100 countries or so. There's hundreds of millions of cases each year, maybe 30 million deaths since I've been involved, and literally billions of cases. It's very devastating. The basic symptoms are chills, fever, sweats, headache, nausea, malaise, etc. But it can be very severe with anemia, organ failure, coma, and death. <clears throat> These are the numbers that I've heard through most of my career, about three to 500 million clinical cases annually, one to three million deaths per year, 3,000 deaths a day, children pregnant, non-immune individuals being most vulnerable. Fortunately, these numbers are starting to come down because there has been intention over the last few decades. It's caused by plasmodium, a eukaryotic single cell organism. There's over 5,000 genes, so it's a very complex life cycle. There's five species that are a threat to humans right now, plasmodium falciparum, vivax, malaria, ovale. I have Noel's eye in yellow because that's a monkey malaria that's now a big threat in Southeast Asia in human populations. There's another monkey malaria that's now also been shown to be transmitted in humans as well. There's major drug resistance challenges, and there's no vaccine yet. So going back to my graduate student days, what did I do? I focused on this particular uh, sporozoite, the front uh, slide that I showed you. That was a malaria sporozoite. And it's coated with this protein. And it was thought back then that that protein alone could become a vaccine. If only we could prevent the sporozoite from going into the liver, by making the circumsporozoite protein vaccine, we would have no malaria. So I was interested in vaccines, but I got my basics in a molecular biology lab interested in evolution, worked on this circumsporozoite gene, plasmodium cynomolgi, monkey malaria complex. And this was the big data of the day. We talk about big data now. This is my big data. You're looking at it. And that was considered big data for the time. It was a one kilobase gene. We studied it in six different strains of plasmodium cynomolgi, and that was a big undertaking that comprised my entire thesis. This work is just a matter of a few days' work today, if it were done today with the high technologies we have. And it was important work, because then there was big news about this particular protein, circumsporozoite protein, being a malaria vaccine. You can kind of read the headlines here, vaccine around the corner. Well, it didn't quite happen to become around the corner. Uh, this was all coming out of my department, NYU Medical Center, trying to push this as a vaccine. And it's still happening till today. This protein is still a front runner in different forms, or the sporozoite in different formats, uh, being produced as a vaccine. So it's, it's been relevant work, and it continues till today. 1992, then as a postdoctoral fellow, this was the focus of my work, now studying proteins that are part of the merozoite stage of the parasite that bursts out of the liver and goes to attack, attack red blood cells. And we're beginning to look at what proteins are important for that process. This cartoon goes back over 20 years now. How does a plasmodium vivax merozoite invade the right red blood cell? That was particularly challenging because this particular species doesn't go to any red blood cell, but only the very young reticulocyte forms. And we identified proteins that were that interacting uh, parasite protein with the host red blood cell. And this work continues today in many labs around the world, trying to make this particular protein a component of vaccines. 
And that's a complex process because the merozoite pictured here as a eukaryotic organism is very complex. It has to attach to the red blood cell, as you see maybe here, and then it's a zippering effect as it tries to get into the red blood cell, and many proteins and cascades of interactions are involved. <clears throat> And then once it gets into the red blood cell, it modifies the host red blood cell. And the next area of my research was on antigenic variation. What happens when the red blood cell is modified, the parasite puts proteins at the surface of the infected red blood cell that are encoded by a big multi-gene family. We described one in this paper. And then they switch. They change their phenotype as the plasmodium infection goes on and the immune response uh, takes hold. So I'm interested in antigenic variation, and this is one of my main topics still until today. As shown here, recently published, 2013, antigenic variation is dependent on a process that also includes the spleen. So that just shows my career is also not just about the parasite in some interactions, but what happens in the host. The immune response is important to sub subdue malaria and make people well, but the spleen also seems to play a role in terms of the antigenic variation process, which is important for the parasite to evade the host immunity. So to this day, this is one of my pet projects, when there's time to fit this in, in between the other things that we have to do uh, as scientists. So bottom line, I've, I've seen, and aside from malaria being a huge problem, malaria life cycle is interesting, it's got a lot of cool science, and that's one of the main messages today uh, for those who might be new to malaria. It's very complex with, the, as we indicated, the uh, sporozoite coming from the mosquito, infecting the liver, growing and multiplying in the liver, and then merozoites, thousands of them bursting out and attaching to the red blood cells and growing in the red blood cells. This is when everybody gets sick. So this is the real severity of the disease, all the complications. Some of those parasites then uh, instead turn into gametocytes, the male and female forms that are picked up by the mosquito to propagate the infection. This is a rather new rendition of the life cycle that also incorporates the work being done in the clinical side of things with humans as well as with non-human primates, which is the focus of much of the work at Emory University at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center and Emory Vaccine Center, where my laboratory is today, as well as at the Centers for Disease Control with whom we collaborate quite regularly. As uh, Dan said, my husband heads the malaria research and development labs there at the CDC. So malaria is complex. You know, that's also why I'm interested in the disease. I knew as a young person I did not want to be bored, so I chose a career that I would never be bored. It involves parasite factors, host factors, geographical and social factors, and all of these determinants ultimately come to determine whether there's going to be an asymptomatic infection where you don't feel the symptoms, you feel symptoms, or you have severe disease or possibly death. And it's actually a small number of people that actually die. So we have an interest in, as scientists to know what is the difference, what goes on in an infection that determines someone will survive or will not survive and how can we intervene. So the challenge today, borrowed two slides now from Jesse Kissinger. Uh, the challenge now is that we're faced with rapidly expanding range and diversity of genomic scale data sets. Not like when I was a student, we had to clone the old-fashioned way a gene at a time. Now it's all laid out for us, and we ask how can we exploit these resources for new therapeutic and di diagnostic tools, as well as to actually make uh, more different types of vaccines, better vaccines, vaccines against multiple species, etc. So back in 2002, the Plasmodium falciparum genome was reported. That's shown here. We also now have the Plasmodium vivax genome and Plasmodium nolzi genome since 2008, Plasmodium cynomolgi since 2010, and there's just continuous work where we can have more and different uh, genome sequence from people around the world in a much, much faster way than ever before. And the technologies have advanced, which are unbelievable now. This high throughput, te throughput technology to do sequencing and then RNA sequencing now, chip chip technologies for epigenetics and all kinds of host pathogen interactions and pathways for biochemistry and metabolism can be determined today in ways that they, we just couldn't have thought of before. This figure goes back to 2010, a small working group of scientists who were particularly interested in Plasmodium vivax. We called ourselves the IVAX team. 
we put together sort of a working plan for what was needed to study plasmodium vivax. And we called this the Wheel of Fortune at the time, kind of we thought we had it all paved out, what we need to think about in terms of the immunology, the vector, the epidemiology, mathematical models, et cetera. But what was key is that host parasite interactions were central to much of the work we needed to do for vivax, let alone falciparum and the other species. This set the stage really nicely when NIH had a contract call for proposals published and we thought let's maybe apply for this. They were looking to fund groups to focus on systems biology. Applicants were required to generate, integrate, and share multiple large omic data sets on host pathogen interactions for persistent and recurrent infections. That wasn't necessarily malaria, could have been some other parasite or bacteria or virus. But we put our heads together at Emory and we invited investigators from UGA, like Jesse Kissinger here in the front row and others, J Jeremy over here. <laughs> we invited the UGA team, Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology investigators and Centers for Disease Control and friends from around the world. We met the deadline of a June 2011 proposal and we did win this award and it started in September 2012. We're proud to say we were the only winners. So this is really neat to think that malaria had gotten such a profile and interest among reviewers and NIH to think that their systems biology big program would focus on malaria. Because we've been a struggling disease, well some may not say so, but compared to other big diseases like HIV or you know, other things that do affect people in the US, we've been relatively underfunded. So this was a good opportunity to be able to study malaria in such a big context. So our project title was Systems Biology of Malaria as a Model for Host Pathogen Interactions, otherwise now known as MAPIC, or Malaria Host Pathogen Interaction Center. It's a large contract, it's 19.4 million, including as a quote, all option quantities, that's contract lingo, different from a grant, and it does involve, as I say, all these institutions and quite a few international collaborators. Key was host and pathogen in anything we did, and key was also having human counterpart in our international collaborations as well as our non-human primate models. It's a big team, so while big money, it gets spread around. Not all these people are working full time, in fact, most aren't. And it's one big project, not multiple projects that just have something in common. So that makes us quite unique. This is like running a small company. We have to be very well coordinated with the same mission, the same goals. We have interactive cores in running malaria work, immune profiling, functional genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, informatics, mathematical modeling, and computation analysis, making this a true systems biology project and not simply a nomics problem, omics project. Omics being proteomics, transcriptomics, and you might integrate those. That's quite different from this having the whole gamut of uh, different core activities that integrate and work together. So here, the project involves a lot of clinical sampling and data collection from non-human primates or humans, a lot of use of these omic tools in bioinformatics and computational models, Ultimately, to understand the disease like we never have before, creating unprecedented data sets that are huge like never before, integrating them, and ultimately putting this out to the scientific community because we're not going to be able to analyze all the data that we're generating. We'll scratch the surface as a team, and then we hope that the world just has a lot of, and a lot of newcomers and young students and postdocs, whatever, have a field day really working with this data. So what is systems biology? To be more explicit, systems biology involves the holistic study of an entire biological system rather than a reductionist, a reductionist approach on one small part of a system. Examples could be the set of biochemical pathways within a cell, the entire cell itself, an organ, organ the whole organism, or the interaction of different organisms. For MAPIC, we're collecting comprehensive data on how plasmodium parasite infections produce changes in host and parasite genes, proteins, lipids, the immune response, and metabolism. It's a big undertaking, to say the least. Computational researchers then design mathematical models to simulate and analyze what's happening during our infections and find patterns that predict the course of the disease and its severity, hopefully to find ways to intervene. 
And just as a note, we believe that such insights can help guide the development of new interventions eventually. It's not the main goal of the project. We just producing the data and learning as much as we can. Others will take over. We're also interested in co-infections and comorbidities. Uh, and also the differences that we'll see from cultural and environmental backgrounds of the communities we're working with. And that's particularly going to be uh, bear true, born true with the metabolomic studies, which I'll mention. I'm just going to see. So we're proud that this is a Georgia project, first of all. We want to, that's another take home message. It's amazing that we've had such talent in this state between all our institutions that we could win such an award and actually be carrying it out pretty well. We're now well into year two. Uh, NIH is happy. Our reviewers are happy. We have an advisory board that's happy. Um, we're happy. <laughs> the main thing now is the challenge facing us. It's a big uh, thing that we're trying to do, and we need to identify what, is the, what are the best biological questions we can address now in this limited time that we have now uh, for the duration of the project. Here just shows as well the different monkey models as well as humans that we work with and also that this is highly collaborative, not just in the endemic countries where you have malaria, um, but also with advisors from different parts of the world who are working with us. Also very important, the CDC mosquito insectary. That's where we get our mosquito infections, we get sporozoites, the form of the parasite that does infect the, the primates and it does cause malaria in the liver and then in the blood stage. So we interact very closely with them to have this process done and also some of the monkey work is done at CDC, though most at Yerkes. We have a central unifying hypothesis for this whole award and that is that non-human primates host interactions with plasmodium pathogens as model systems will provide insights into mechanisms as well as indicators for human malarial disease conditions. And that's to be tested. I mean, we really believe from knowledge to date and the work we've done for decades in non-human primates that it will and does mimic the human infections. And that should come much clearer with all the data being generated to understand these infections. Here's a basic workflow of the project. Uh, we basically are having different monkey infections done and also collecting samples from humans. That, inf that, that work is run by the Malaria Corps, who catalogs all the clinical features of the infections and all the metadata associated with those infections. And then samples, blood samples or bone marrow samples or whatnot are divvied up or divided into the different core labs to carry out immune profiling, innate and adaptive immune profiling, functional genomics with RNA-seq to get the whole transcriptome, proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics. There's in-house analysis after a lot of high throughput testing is done in these cores. Then the data is transferred to the informatics core here at UGA and it is processed further and put out in a way then to the mathematicians that they can actually work with the data to create models on how, what, how malaria is, is actually developed in the host red blood cell, how anemia develops, how the infection progresses, how the immune response kicks in, etc. Mathematicians are doing that work to better make use of our data and then come back and guide us to revise our experiments. Informatics core is also key for getting the data eventually out to the public in a usable format. This gives you an idea in brief of a 100-day infection in macaques at Yerkes. We basically start with the sporozoite infections and every day there's sampling happening to be sure of how the parasitemia, parasites are rising in the blood and then anemia is setting in, for example. There might be subcurative treatment and then parasites come up again and anemia sets in. Meanwhile, the immune response is happening. So we're watching that course of infection and clinical parameters every day. Every other day we're taking a sample for metabolomics to watch the metabolism of the parasite in the host. And then on specific time points, we're doing all these other omics to watch the immune response, et cetera, as it develops. These are our parasites in our models. Plasmodium falciparum, the most severe worldwide malaria parasite in the world, is being modeled with plasmodium cotinii. They have very similar biology and very similar metabolism, and severe disease sets in for both. And importantly, both of these parasites have these this is colorized, but this is an infected plasmodium, uh, infected red blood cell. 
And you see all the little speckling. Those are called knobby protrusions. Both of these species have knobby protrusions at the surface of the red blood cell. The parasite puts proteins at the surface and they're sticky. And that causes a big problem. For example, here, those sticky parasites block vessels, for example, in the brain, causing cerebral malaria. They stick to receptors in the placenta, causing problem for pregnant women. The other major human malaria is Plasmodium vivax, and we model that with the monkey malaria Plasmodium cytomolgi. These two have similar biologies, including a different surface structure. At the surface of these parasites, you have hundreds of these structures made at the surface of the infected red blood cell, and they're tubules and they've got vesicles. The blue area is the, is the opening of the red blood cell. So hundreds of these are opening to the surface of the red blood cell. We don't know what they do, but we would like to know more and we may learn from this project. This is an example of uh, those parasites. If you just look at a blood smear, you see all those speckled dots in a blood smear. Each one of those dots rep represents one of those complex structures I just showed you in 3D. Here, by electron microscopy, you can see at the surface there are actual indentations opening to the surface. So that's got to be important for the parasite survival, taking in things from the circulation, maybe letting things out from the circulation, we just don't know precisely. Also, parasites are known to communicate with other parasites to say maybe change your antigenicity of vaccines here or whatever, um, and these things might be important for that. Another important part of the biology with Plasmodium vivax and cytomology is this hypnozoi and the relapse of infections. These parasites, quite uniquely compared to falciparum, have a dormant stage in the liver. For these parasites, you get an initial schizont with thousands, tens of thousands of parasites in the liver bursting out into the blood, but you also have these little pin dot parasites uh, called hypnozoites that are dormant, they don't grow, but weeks, months, or years out, they may burst from the liver and cause an infection again. Uh, that's, see, you see this one is starting to grow, and it eventually will grow and multiply. These were discovered in 1982, but no work was done on them for decades. We just didn't have the tools and the means or the finances to even start to understand these things. But that's beginning to change today, partly because of advocacy, saying we need to work on Vivax too. In 2007, October, Bill and Melinda Gates said they wanted to eradicate malaria. And if they were to do that, it can't just be falciparum, it has to be Vivax, and it has to be Nolzai. It has to be whatever malaria we have uh, in, in circulating, circulating in the world. So this project has finally gotten attention, and this was recently published in, well, this month in 2014, just published, Nature Medicine News and Views. It's an article that I wrote along with John Barnwell. Uh, showing this picture gives you an idea of the progress that's happening now with hypnozoites to study relapses. This is actually News and Views start talking about an article published by Dembele, a European group et al., in the previous issue of Nature Medicine. But if you're interested in this topic, this is very, very important stuff now. The fact that we can take the plasmodium cytomology parasite and actually culture it in vitro and then see these things activate is brand new. In fact, we've never seen them actually activate. We've seen pictures of them. Now we can do it in culture and see them activate and maybe figure out what's making them activate and either find a drug to stop them from activating or alternatively, cause them to activate so you can treat them in the blood. Reason being, if you have these hypnozoites in the liver and person is constantly getting sick, so go back to advocacy again. A lot of the advocacy from Laria is buy a bed net, save a life. If you buy a bed net, you don't protect individuals who have these dormant hypnozoites in their liver. We need another means to know that they're there and to get rid of them. Just for the sake of the science, to give a broader, a broad overview of what, what's possible, genetic manipulations are possible in malaria. And particularly with the non-human primates, we're finding that they're going to probably make a difference for us understanding the hypnozoite and following the full life cycle of the disease. And this may also be important for MAPIC. Our last parasite that we're working with predominantly from the MAPIC project is Plasmodium nolzi. I told you this is monkey malaria now in Southeast Asia in maybe thousands of cases by now. We can study it in this natural host in um, Southeast Asian monkeys. 
experimental rhesus monkey host and in culture or in humans. And it's different in all cases. And we're going to be doing a lot of comparative work to understand these differences. In particular, the natural host, it's a mild infection, while in the experimental host, it's a very severe infection. You can put one infected red blood cell, and we've shown this, and the parasitemia, the parasites rise up to a very dangerous level in the animal if not treated. So year one, as I said, we're into year two of the MAPIC project. Year one has been focused on a lot of infrastructure for running this uh, small business, as I say, and particularly moving secure data, which has been the responsibility of Jesse Kissinger her UGA, working with Jeremy, also in the audience. But it's been a lot of work to have uh, both everybody understand how the data has to move and be processed, and this is just a schematic to make that point that a lot of work has gone into that. We've also had a lot of work with Mark Stajinsky, particularly taking the lead at Georgia Tech in figuring out data analysis pipelines, how we're going to analyze all these uh, unprecedented volumes of data coming from the different omics, genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, et cetera, as well as clinical data and immunological data. So he's coming up with pipelines for how we're going to analyze this so that that data is useful back for the mathematicians and other scientists, including ourselves. And then the big challenge of the day and state of the art for science is how do you integrate this information? It's been some time that we, you hear about scientists studying transcriptome, all the transcripts from the parasite or organisms, or the proteome, all the proteins. But how they all relate to each other is the real challenge. And these are investigators leading metabolomics core, lipidomics, proteomics, functional genomics, have been working together on other projects as well to, to take on those challenges of showing how they relate to each other. And immune response, you know, and we've, you know, when I was a graduate student, we would be doing simple things to study an antibody response or a T cell response or a B cell response, but it's much more complex than that. And we're learning from experts on our team who are really giving it their all to do the most comprehensive analysis of the immune response. Uh, using high-tech flow cytometry and other methods to study the innate immunity, what happens when you initially get the infection, what kind of immune response takes place within the next first few days, so they're naturally, uh, natural immune response to the host. And then adaptive immunity, what kind of immune response continues to happen over time, and also accounts for the infection, a second infection in the same individual to be less severe. These are some of the players from the immune, uh, immune profiling core and our malaria core, I mean, just top leaders from our multiple institutions, um, including uh, my husband. <laughs> he's out having a good time most of the time these days, but he's uh, one of the key experts with 40 years experience, highly valuable, uh, clearly, for this core, as well as other cores. A uh, brand new graduate student who is completely dedicated to this immune response work. Uh, that's really a backup, or the leader in many respects, for all of these other leaders who are helping to design the work. I really want to acknowledge him as well. And last but not least, metabolomics. Very key to be able to study the metabolism of the parasite and the host in a way like never before. Literally within a couple drops of blood, we can get the plasma from a sample from the monkeys or from humans and get up to about 20,000 metabolites identified from a little tiny drop of blood, which is quite extraordinary. And the truth is it may be 100,000 or 200,000 with the way the technologies are going to do high resolution metabolomics. Our leader there, Professor Dean Jones, is interested in all of these things about this whole life cycle I showed you. While Mapix focused on the blood, he has a vision to understand the metabolomics of as much of this as possible. And that's not his main thing. He's, he's drawn into malaria through our project, but he's interested in many different mm -hmm. things, in particular <coughs> nutrition and the exposome. He, he wants to understand all the exposures that you, receive, that you are exposed, people are exposed to from the time they're in the womb throughout life and how that affects the metabolism. And that's important for us too. When we think of taking samples from around the world, it's not just about the parasite and the immune response and what's going on with the infection, but the metabolome will show what chemicals are in the environments in different countries and what nutritions and cultural habits, it all shows up in the metabolome. Insecticides that are in the air, et cetera. Data, 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 another slide from Jesse. 
Uh, this is just all work that has been in progress and continues to be in progress uh, and ultimate goal to get information out to the community. But it's been a big effort to see all the data that comes from the different cores and different types of data to come in a usable format to UGA here in the informatics core in a format that also then the investigators can pull it back out and actually analyze it further and then eventually get to the community. And now that we have the data, this is all starting to work. We can also work and analyze data together in-house. The vision is also to have these interaction tools, these ways that we're going to be putting the information out to the scientific community serve a broader purpose. This could well be beyond malaria. It's all about host pathogen interaction. So as Jesse says, it's not just about the host and the or the pathogen. We have to find tools that we can use in a relational database so people can understand and ask questions about what's going on with both of these things. And then the mathematics. Mathematics is a little foreign to me. You know, we all took our courses, but I never focused on this. This leader, uh, Professor Eberhard Voigt from Georgia Tech, has been a mathematician focusing for well over 30 years, 40 years perhaps, and he just wrote a book on systems biology. I highly recommend it. Uh, but he, he simplifies it for us, and he makes it sound easy. Basically, you say you get ideas, you draft models, you analyze, more data comes in, you refine, you do a reality check, and all of a sudden, this is an iterative process, and you get insights. And we're starting to see that happen. So it's very nice to have such members of the team who are just confident, and they're learning about malaria, we're learning a little bit about math, but it's amazing how the, it, the, just, the, the conversations take place, and we ultimately make progress together. And the progress where it counts. One of the areas that they are modeling in the ma mathematical core is anemia. What happens when people get anemic? You have the parasite invaded the red blood cell and they burst. But there's uninfected red blood cells that are also being eliminated. And the bone marrow is not working properly and there's so much we don't know. And so they are studying up what's known about anemia and now our data is coming in from our project and they're applying that to the models to ultimately understand what kind of key things have we been missing all these years while doing this without big data um, mechanisms. And the human studies, oh, we're good on time, just checking, <laughs> good on time. The project has also required, as part of the contract, that we have a human component. So while the non-human primates is our day-to-day -day ongoing work, we have set up collaborations literally around the world this just shows a few of our starting points with samples already in-house from Brazil, from the Amazon, the top group studying severe disease in the Amazon. Also in place, probably next in line, will be from Colombia, top work group there working in vaccines in Colombia. Also talking with people from India, Papua New Guinea and Thailand to be next in line. In addition, it's been very attractive. The idea to get a whole metabolome with 20,000 chemicals from such a you know, small sample of blood has been attractive to quite a few people. So we've been lining up quite a few others with interest also from several African countries, Malaysia where you have the Plasmodium nolzai, monkey malaria infections. Peru, we have a fellow of infectious disease from Peru. He's involving his, uh, his colleagues. The countries here, just for uh, just by background information, I have scientific consultation group. When we were writing this proposal, we engaged people from around the world who are scientists in malaria just to be a scientific consultation group. Many of them are actually involved with these uh, human sample uh, collaborations we have because they are leaders in these various countries in, in the research and in, in the clinical environment. We also have an overriding uh, host pathogen working group now that we've met for the first time. That group involves mostly mathematicians and the like. Very few malaria experts, but a few who are working in the field in Africa. So that also broadens our reach of advice coming in. So we invite you to the website to learn more. Uh, this we hope to keep updated on a regular basis so you can see our progress and access information. Uh, learn about the different groups, learn about the scientists. There's quite a few videos of most of the investigators and some of our advisors there. You can go there and get their perspectives of what this big data project is really all about and what they hope to see come from it. Dan said I was daunting. Well, our advisory member said this project was daunting. 
overwhelming, intimidating, outside my area of expertise. You know, most of them that we asked were jumping to be interested and be on board with us. But this was the feedback, and we can understand, because when we read that uh, call for proposals, we were intimidated. It was out of my area of expertise. And certainly as we do this on I mean, a day-to-day, -day, as we're running this small business, it's, uh, it's got a lot of different, obviously a lot of different types of science, a lot of different things that are, one needs to know to make this all work. But it's a team. It's an incredible team. We've become friends from day one when we met, and it continues to be the case, and I certainly hope that continues, because it is, uh, what teamwork is what make it happen. Teamwork and great networking, people who really care about this project and want to see us make a difference in understanding malaria. But it's also not just interdisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary, it's not just multidisciplinary. The truth is it's transdisciplinary, a word I stumbled across recently in trying to figure out what is this? <laughs> transdisciplinary, we're truly speaking different languages and we get together and we have just a lot of great debate and discussion as we're trying to have the other groups and these different omics and mathematicians and whatever understand each other. And keep the train moving to actually have this project on track, meeting milestones, and making a difference. And transdisciplinary, it's a, it's a great word. I do think it's, uh, it's worth looking up on Wikipedia to give you an idea of what they really mean, because I haven't seen it used very much, but to me it definitely fits this project. That's the end of MAPIC. I thought if we had a little time, I'd just run through some fast slides to give you an idea of sort of where I've been the rest of my time and what I call my volunteer time over the last 30 years. Been interested in bridging research and control with education and development. Initially, this was a big challenge because people who did research really didn't talk 30 years ago with people who were interested in treating the disease and working on the ground. That's completely changed today. People who do research and people who could try to control the disease or eliminate the disease, they're all talking. But there's still a gap in really the importance of education, not just behavior change communication, a public health term. True education and true development, which is what makes the difference in, in what has made the difference in the US and Europe and places that used to have malaria, it was really about development. So back years ago, it's already over 20 years ago, yes, I started the Malaria Foundation International, and we had a mission to facilitate, not to take over, not to run the show, but to facilitate the development and implementation of solutions to the health, economic, and social problems caused by malaria, and that stands still today. We also set up by 1995 the first major malaria website, malaria.org, and remember in these days, there really wasn't an internet. You know, when I started this, there were about a dozen sites I was aware of, IBM and a few others that I can go to for some idea of what this thing called the World Wide Web was. There wasn't some place I can just go and find anything about malaria. I wrote to the World Health Organization and got a one-page flyer after some time. So the internet wasn't there. We started this with a blank slate. We had the goals to first create attention on the disease. At the time, remember I was at NYU Medical Center, there was vaccine news out there, but you know that was that occasional news about malaria, and that's all there was in the newspaper, in the real hard newspaper that we used to have in those days. Uh, and then secondly, we wanted to take steps to move towards ending malaria, words we've used since 2006 when we launched this blue ribbon. We've always had the feeling that, you know, it's not just about the science or the public health, it's research, education, training, and advocacy were all going to underpin and be important for the prevention, treatment, and control efforts. And it's becoming commonplace again, but that was not commonplace going back 20 or 30 years ago. These were our long-standing goals, which still fit today. You can kind of peruse them. I don't want to take the time necessarily to read all, but the idea of we need to have communication and coordination. We need networking. We need, um, we need finances, of course. Uh, we need education and training of the next generation of experts. We need a concerted voice for scientists in issues of public debate concerning malaria. We put these out, these, these goals out shortly after about 1995, I'd say, and they've been picked up, in fact, almost verbatim by some groups that have taken on malaria, other big consortiums that have been important for the field, like the Multilateral Initiative on Malaria, for starters, followed by Rollback Malaria. 
this just gives you a sense of each kind of over the years there have been various projects that have uh, become important for the malaria foundation working with scientists we've had different sort of low, uh, slogans over the years embracing humanity worldwide global networking against malaria empowering people to act anything we can to kind of to get people involved i want to just give you a few slides now kind of quickly to kind of summarize a few little highlights for me of our work this was very important in 1997. We put on a, we coordinated along with uh, investigators from CDC at the time. I was just being contacted to consider coming to Atlanta. And we were running this major conference in India to celebrate the, find, uh, the discoveries of Ronald Ross for the discovery of the malaria parasite in the mosquito. So there was a 100th anniversary at the time. We put together, importantly, the first malaria fact pack. Again, no internet to go to. We had a scientific advisory board of 30 people put together all the basic information about malaria, what it is, how you get it, the numbers, things that are readily available today. But that was a starting point that we know top leaders, even in our, gov our government officials, used uh, to learn about the basics of malaria. And we had global press at the time, highly unusual, and that led us also to get recognition, such that we were contacted a year later by the Department of International Development in the UK, asked us to do another campaign. That campaign turned out to be the launch of Rollback Malaria, which has been a major effort working from the Geneva, connected to the WHO there, but involving people all around the world to actually see how are we going to actually bring this disease under control. One of the fun things we did kind of in that period of time, March 1999, is we worked with David Robertson, an explorer who likes to travel around the world, and he actually had malaria in 1992, and he launched, we launched a program with him leaving South Africa, and he went through about 22 or so countries in Africa. We brought his Land Rover down there, and he was traveling through Africa and, and bringing awareness. This period marked the DDT campaign. Um, still lots of discussions and controversies. But there was a time in 1999, it was brought to our attention that this was going to be banned with uh, including a dozen, uh, in or, uh, dozen pollutants considered, uh, con compounds to be considered pollutants. And malaria scientists got on board to say it's too premature. This is a very important insecticide for eliminating or for, for mosquito control, particularly if used properly around houses or in houses. And we got 400 signatures in 65 countries at the time, and that was a big thing, once again, while the internet for such purposes was still brand new. In 04, it was very important that we were behind the scenes in an advocacy campaign to take a big change in how drugs were being used. Chloroquine, sulfadoxin pyrimethamine were being used widely and were being funded and paid for widely, but they were not very effective. In, in many parts of the world, it might be 60% of the uh, chance so that it may not, they may not work. So there was a big push to bring to common use these compounds called, called ACTs, artemisinin and combination therapies. And we did, just with, along with many others, behind the work advocacy that actually made a big change. From this point forward, they became the mainstream uh, use, uh, drugs used throughout the world. So now for just some fun stuff. We're having a, a symposium here at UGA tomorrow on malaria. Uh, we had a, what we called our Malaria Business Leadership Conferences a few years in a row in December 05 to do what I think might be similar, not just engage scientists, but also administrators and students and the public, marketing, business people, what have you, to show there's all different types of uh, roles people can play to help solve the problem of malaria. Here our, lo our slogan was engaging new leaders. The year after, we were trying to inspire the world. And we brought in children who were also being involved in our Blue Ribbon campaign at the time. One week later from that event, the White House had a malaria summit. I was fortunate to attend on behalf of the Malaria Foundation. And that was a big thing because President Bush had just started what was called the President's Malaria Initiative with 1.2 billion to fight the disease in 15 countries in Africa. That program continues today. 
Then we got excited about a new initiative. You can see we just kept moving. There were a lot of people getting involved now, but we as the foundation, on a shoestring budget, mostly volunteer, we just said, where are their gaps? And we decided to have what we called the End Malaria Awards with 50 categories to honor malaria's unsung heroes. And it was a fun project. We involved students to go and find now with the internet available all the different things that started going on around the world and honor those people for doing different, playing different roles to fight the disease. We stopped after 2008 because so much is going on, it was literally hard to keep track. It would truly be a full-time job and that remains the case today. I'd love to do it for as a full-time job if we had only the time to do multiple full-time jobs. <laughs> Um, we did notice though in 2008, and this is where our, our, we say we keep looking for gaps where we might still make a difference, education still remains, uh, I think, under, uh, under recognized as something critical for the long term. If we start educating today, 5, 10, 20 years out, you're not going to have to be telling people a lot of the same things we'll still tell them today about malaria. And I think that's very important in all the communities. It's starting to happen. And anything we can do in the future, I don't know what if the time will be right, we'd like to keep focusing on this particular topic. We started in 05 with a class, a high school class um, in Atlanta. Uh, they really got us excited. And they also partnered with students in Michigan and started to partner with students in Africa. We then launched the End Malaria Blue Ribbon in 2006 at a major society meeting in Atlanta, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, also involving young children. Here our Blue Ribbon girl, Camille, did a great job reaching out and having a chance to volunteer for the first time in her life. She's now going off to college. Time passes. And they, interestingly, we launched that in Atlanta, but word got out. We got contacted from people in different parts of the world wanting to join this campaign. And I'm just showing you what people have done on their own in India. India and Assam, north of India, they contacted, showing us pictures. They started blue ribbon clubs, blue ribbon parades, blue ribbon clubs where the students would go out into the community and start to teach other people. And this they did all on their own. Botswana got very active, having regular education campaigns involving the students. I had the privilege of joining them one time here for their one day education uh, day at school. And then we all went up to the north, went into the villages, and we went to talk to people in the villages, distribute bed nets, etc. Nigeria, another top leader in our campaign, leaders from an organization called the Society for Youth Awareness, Health and Development. They too, you can see, took it upon themselves to start end malaria blue ribbon campaigns and teach their students. And Tanzania. Just to give you an idea, there's been a, really a dozen or so that were top leaders. Uh, this gentleman here, Eli Pokeyuria, an amazing man from Tanzania, started Youth Development Network. So we had a rapport because he had a bigger vision. He wants to empower all the young people to not just know about malaria and other diseases, but really motivate them for development projects, which uh, according to my bridge, as shown in my bridge picture, is really the ultimate goal to achieve development in these countries. This classroom that you see here, he built this classroom. I went back to this classroom in Arusha a few years later. It was beautiful, it's painted, he's got it furnished, he's got nice things for the children right now, he's made a huge difference. So, in closing, we're just gonna sum up at this point, I think we're still doing pretty nicely on time. I've been involved in a lot of things since 1992 and the launch of the Malaria Foundation website in 1995. There's all kinds of stuff happening now, it's hard to follow it all. I, I do my best while also doing the science now is my main thing. But I think it's important to be aware of what else is happening. And when the time is right, maybe participate in other things on the global scale. We will see. As Dan said, yes, I'm a martial artist. The martial artist group, uh, Troy Kwon Do, has been fighting malaria at times with me around the world. They, they're in 40 countries, and they had the vision, yes, let's, let's work on it together. So we'll see where that goes. Um, as many push, I mean, it's really, like I say, hard to follow. You just have to Google and you're going to see activity everywhere. Question is how effective? What's it really going to take? Uh, as I say, there's a push to eliminate malaria in different countries and slowly work towards, or maybe not so slowly, work to eradicate it. That's a big call. Can we eradicate malaria? <laughs>
We will see. You can start to watch if you want to see the progress with the World Malaria Reports, originally published in 2005, and then there was a gap. And then with the call for elimination and eradication, it's now published annually. So you can see, if you go from year to year, how the numbers and the projections stand from countries, uh, literally by countries around the world. In 2008, it was also the publication of a global malaria action plan involving people from all around the world. I understand that there's a new one that's in progress that may come out this year, if not next year. So in closing, once again, we have momentum to end malaria. We're working as best we can on different aspects of it. But it takes, it's going to take a much larger group of people. It's going to take continued coordination efforts, political will, finances, you name it. And uh, if I just do a show of hands, who thinks we can eradicate malaria in here? Anybody have anybody think that it's a real goal to work for eradicating malaria? No one's uh, up for, ah, I see a thumb up. <laughs> I see a couple hands, OK. I hope so. And people are not as ready to rush and say, definitely not five years or 10 years. I think most people in the know, we used to think vaccine five or 10 years, but even now we're much more cautious in uh, what we say as a, as a research community. Um, but literally decades, 50 years, probably not in my lifetime is what you will hear people honestly say today. And my view of it is, just to be cute a little bit, it's a big world. And there's many Anopheles mosquitoes out there. And you know, when I sit in a conference room or around the world, and you go and you hear talking about eradication, and people get all fired up, especially as newcomers, I just have to get off a plane in the environment where you have these mosquitoes and you have this transmission, and you ask how. <laughs> how is this really going to happen? It's going to be a, to, that's why I think it ultimately is going to come down to a lot more education, changing the development, roads, clinics, everything all needs to be improved. And vaccines and new drugs and all the things we work on are going to be good resources, but not the total answer. And this is also to say I totally overlooked the mosquito. This mosquito hasn't been my thing, though I think it's fun. <laughs> a lot of things going on. And epidemiology, we really need a lot of effort on all those fronts as well. Thank you very much.